Hello, everyone, and welcome to Looking Back to Look Forward, the race to 5G. My name is Jeffrey Westling, and I am a resident fellow here at the R Street Institute. Uh, much of our work uh, over the last few years has been focused on reducing regulatory barriers to broadband deployment. And, you know, with the pandemic and everything going on, broadband connectivity is just more important than ever. Uh, the Commission's 5G Fast Plan has been a critical strategy uh, in, in helps speeding up the deployment of these next generation networks. Uh, and importantly, keeping Americans connected. Uh, today, we are extremely fortunate to have the architect of the plan, Chairman Ajit Pai, here for a fireside chat with our co-host, Crown Castle CEO, J.A. Brown, uh, to discuss the Commission's regulatory reforms over the last few years and their impact on actual practitioners. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stacey Pies with uh, Crown Castle. Thanks, Jeff. It's my pleasure to be here with you this afternoon to talk about the importance of American leadership and broadband in 5G wireless. I have been in this industry since before the time we called it broadband. And when my smartphone was a Sprint, I think 3G Palm device, might've been 2G. But one thing that we can all agree on is that facilitating investment and adoption in innovative broadband technologies has always been a bipartisan priority. So I'm excited to host this conversation with FCC Chairman Ajit Pai and Jay Brown, CEO of Crown Castle, my CEO. So I'll kick off this discussion with Chairman Pai with questions and conversations about the advancements in infrastructure deployment over the last four years. So welcome. Hey, great to be with you, Stacey, and good to see you too, Jay. Good to see you as well, Chairman. Thank you. So, Mr. Chairman, when you started your chairmanship four years ago, 5G was kind of at the earliest stages of deployment. And now, just recently, we've heard from Apple with their launch of the iPhone 12 to include 5G and a number of interesting technological developments. How did we get from then to now? And can you talk about what the roadblocks were that you identified that could have held the FC or held the US back, but that you've cleared out of the way for 5G deployment. I would love to. Uh, before I do though, uh, Stacey, I would be remiss if I didn't thank you, uh, Jeffrey, Crown Castle and R Street for hosting this conversation. It's great to have a forum like this to talk about some of the great work that's being uh, done in the public and the private sectors to advance uh, wireless innovation for the benefit of the American consumer. And uh, speaking of which, I too uh, remember the early days of cellular when I had a split split phone and I thought it's not gonna get any better than this. <laughs> just I thought it wasn't getting any better than the Atari 2600 in the early 1980s. But sure enough, you know, technology marches forward and the FCC has been a critical part of that. Uh, we adopted the FCC's uh, 5G Fast Plan a couple of years ago. That plan of course had three basic component parts, uh, freeing up more spectrum from the commercial marketplace, promoting wireless infrastructure and modernizing our regulations to encourage fiber deployment. On, on each of those three vectors, we've been incredibly aggressive, uh, freed up over 5,000 megahertz of spectrum in the high band millimeter wave for 5G commercial use. Of course, we've completed the repack in the 600 megahertz band, the broadband incentive auction has gone very well and that three year repack has gone off smoothly. And recently we've been focused very aggressively on mid band spectrum. We just completed a 3.5 gigahertz auction, we have the big C band auction coming up on December 8th, options next year of 2.5, hopefully, and 3.45 to 3.55. And the other piece of it as well, I know we focus typically on license, but unlicensed has been in focus as well. So getting the six gigahertz band, 1200 megahertz uh, test bed for innovators and innovation out there. Uh, there's a 5G NRU specification that cellular users can uh, use for uh, the six gigahertz spectrum for. And hopefully next week that my colleagues will agree with me on the 5.9 gigahertz band, a 45 additional megahertz in the Uni4 band that uh, will create a gigabit Wi-Fi potential uh, with 160 megahertz wide channel. So that's just spectrum. Obviously on infrastructure as well, we've promoted small cell reforms that have led to 87,000 small cells being deployed in the United States in my tenure, 46,000 of those last year alone, and fiber deployment, setting records in 2018 and 2019. So uh, obviously we played a small role. Uh, the, you know, the credit is due primarily to infrastructure builders like Crown Castle, the companies like Apple that uh, build this infrastructure. But uh, I, I like to think that the FCC has helped put the building blocks in place for American consumers to benefit. That's great. Thank you so much. That's a, a really wonderful introduction to all of the changes and the innovations that have truly made a difference. And I'm just going to ask Jay, as the largest provider of shared infrastructure in the United States, how have the FCC's actions and Chairman Pai's leadership impacted the ability of our company 
to deploy for our customers. And if you could just share some real world examples, that would be fantastic. Sure. And I can drop off the call if you want to be honest, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's terrific. It's terrific to be with you all and, and great to be with you, Chairman Pai, again. Uh, we certainly all appreciate the work that you've done. Uh, that ultimately leads to great innovation and lower cost for us as consumers. And we have much better devices today and, and even better to come as a result of some of the work that the FCC has done uh, around 5G. Um, as a company, we own both small cells and macro tower sites. We have 40,000 towers in the U.S. and some 80,000 route miles of of fiber and about 70,000 small cells that are either built currently or, or on the way to being built. And uh, so there's been a lot of activity as we start to build towards 5G and really critically important for 5G is the ability to build it expeditiously, uh, to have a certainty around what the time frame for build is, as well as what the costs are uh, around that build. Uh, and I would just point to an example, uh, Chairman Pai, of your leadership and how it's helped our industry is the FCC's upgrade order, uh, which has given you know, some, some, some guidelines and, and guardrails both around the time to build as well as the cost to build this infrastructure that has been just incredibly helpful to the industry. And uh, a recent example would have been some of the work that's, that's, that's happened at the city of Long Beach. Uh, we needed to build fiber there for 5G, and uh, some of the, so the some of the rules and and uh, policies that the FCC has set out have created a framework for us to be able to work with the local municipalities in order to expedite that activity. So we were able to work with them, set forth a plan. Uh, we set out a plan to build fiber there in Long Beach. Set out a six-week plan. Uh, worked with them around what it would look like, how we would do it. And, uh, and then ultimately we're able to get it done and they had the right to come back and inspect it, make sure we did it right. But that's a win for everyone, right? It's a public private partnership and uh, the rules that the FCC has set out really give um, not only the sort of the, 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 the beginning of what will be innovation, but the really the practical, the hard stuff around how do we actually get this uh, technology deployed into the market at the, at the local level. And uh, these, these rules have been a great framework uh, to facilitate private public partnership at the local level. Thank you, Jay, I appreciate that. And the specific example of working with the city of Long Beach, we could probably talk all afternoon about some really positive partnerships we've developed as a result of the rules that have been adopted. So I really appreciate that. So Chairman Pai, you talked a little bit about the number of um, spectrum proceedings that the commission has worked through over the last few years, in addition to a couple more items that you have on the agenda for the next commission meeting. What more do you think that we need to be doing as a country to bring more spectrum to the commercial market? And do you have any suggestions on how as an industry we should be advocating for the availability of more spectrum, both licensed and unlicensed? It's a good question. I mean, certainly I think we have done a lot over the last three and a half, almost four years. Our goal has been pretty ambitious, effectively to remove uh, spectrum availability as a constraint on innovation. And you know, that's a bold ambition to be sure. But part of the reason is that we want to stay in advance as, to the extent we can of consumer demand. I think as consumers demand ever more wireless uh, con con connectivity, as the IoT environment explodes with billions more devices coming on the network and as 5G involves uh, ever more use cases, we wanna make sure that we don't fall behind in terms of making spectrum available for both licensed and unlicensed use. And so um, part of the problem is of course, that there is no more greenfield spectrum. Uh, as I found out in space over the last couple of years, uh, there are always going to be incumbencies, uh, both public and private. And so the goal has to be to work cooperatively with everybody to tr come up with to the extent you can, consensus solutions that are based on sound engineering and economics. And we've done that in a variety of ways. So CBRS, of course, involved a three-tier structure, which may seem a little bit cumbersome at first, but was a way of accommodating some of the Department of Defense incumbencies and still allowing everything from Palace to GAA below that. Uh, same thing with C-Band, working, coming up with creative solutions to enable satellite companies to deliver important programming in the upper 200 megahertz of the C-Band and accept accelerated relocation to, to allow that lower 280 to be cleared. Or an unlicensed too. I mean, we've got some incumbencies there, electric utilities and others. And in every one of these cases, we've tried to focus on the engineering and just figure out if there's a way to thread that needle. That's going to be incredibly more difficult in the time ahead. And so I would hope that... Uh, 
either through congressional action of reforming how spectrum policy is done or through the FCC itself, uh, we'll be able to come up with further win-win solutions. Uh, it's not going to be easy. I mean, as you, and you can Google uh, some of the battles we've had over spectrum in the last couple of years to, uh, to see, but at the end of the day, as a result of our decisions, uh, you're focusing on the facts and the law, I think the American consumer is going to be much better off. And I would always hope that that will be the lodestar for any commission. That's great, thank you. And Jay, I'll just give you a moment to talk a little bit about what the impact of all of this new spectrum is on the market on Crown Castle and our ability to be able to deliver for our customers who are either participating in the spectrum auctions or are utilizing the unlicensed spectrum that has been made available. Sure, I, I don't think we could overstate the importance of what Chairman Pai just talked about, uh, of the low band, mid band, the high band spectrum, and what and the work that the FCC has undertaken. And, and Chairman Pai, just as a part of the entire ecosystem, I would just thank you for what you've done, uh, laying the foundation for innovation in wireless. And uh, we as American consumers are, are going to benefit for this for decades, uh, decades to come. I think it positions us in the world for innovation uh, unmatched anywhere else in the world. I, I, I noted recently that 20% of the, of the global CapEx spend for telecom happens in the US where we only have 5% of the population. And a part of that is driven because of the ability to have this, this valuable asset spectrum bands available. And you know, I would probably put the word remarkable uh, on what's happened over the last four years to, to make available to the ecosystem, the mid and the high band spectrum for 5G uh, is gonna just, it's gonna be the start of a significant amount of innovation, obviously with the iPhone, the new iPhone 12 launch uh, using millimeter wave embedded in it is gonna open up a lot of activity. And ultimately as consumers, we benefit because it's gonna drive down the cost of that offering and offer it to more people. So it's a, I think it's a virtuous cycle that we benefit uh, in the business community from all the way down to the consumer. And, uh, and, and it creates uh, the opportunity for us as a nation uh, to develop and to innovate in ways that I think are gonna lead the world uh, as we move into 5G. That's great, thank you. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit as we wind up our conversation. This fireside chat went very fast. <laughs> I, I just wanna talk briefly about the new innovations in open radio access network architecture. I know that's something, uh, Chairman Pai, that your commission has been very focused on. You had a full day event that we had a number of folks from Crown Castle listen in on. So if you could just talk about what the opportunity is there, and then Jay, I'll leave the question for you just to respond immediately. What's the view of the Open RAN opportunity for Crown and the industry, and what does Crown have to offer in that space? So Chairman well, Pai. With the obvious caveat up front that Jay has probably forgotten more about this than I will ever know since he is in the infrastructure business, uh, what I would say is that I'm very excited about the potential for Open RAN network. So we saw during that forum, all kinds of companies from Rakuten and Reliance Geo Abroad to Altio Star and Parallel Wireless and Avenue here in the United States that open RAN technologies are here, they are now, they're, they're, they're being deployed in ways that not just reduce the cost elements in building the next generation wireless network, but also put the keys to security in the hands of the operator. And they also serendipitously solve some of the issues that we've seen with the more consolidated full stack hardware vendors uh, around the world that sometimes present a national security threat uh, to these next generation networks. And so our hope is to encourage both from a public and private sector perspective, the development and deployment of these open RAN technologies. Uh, about a year and a half, almost two years ago, I guess it was, I had a chance to visit with Rakuten in Japan. And I went, as I was going through their deck, it just seemed incredible some of the stuff that they were envisioning for open RAN. And I remember thinking, is this really possible? And now I have to say that it is, we stand on the brink of some of that innovation. It's a great example in the telecom sector of what Clayton Christensen, the late Clayton Clayton Christensen used to call the innovator's dilemma that you know, here we have a very difficult problem to solve in terms of relatively few global suppliers of hardware. Well, we innovate around that problem by having companies out there doing the hard work to virtualize these networks. So I'm excited to see where it goes. I think whether you're, a, you're building on a 4G network, some of this open RAN technology or building a standalone network on 5G, uh, the, the sky's the limit. So I can't wait to see where Crown and other companies take it. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's almost impossible to improve upon that answer. I, th I think he nailed it. Um, it's the lower cost, it's the innovation platform of the future. And, and I think it widens the deployment opportunities for entrepreneurs 
So it's not only innovation by logos and names that we all know, but it also creates a platform for new entrepreneurs to be able to use the networks uh, in ways that I think will be really beneficial. And again, ultimately the cost of that and the, the, the savings of that at the business level gets passed all the way to the consumer. And so when I think forward about what it's gonna mean uh, in terms of the internet of things to the users and, and the ability of the operators of the network to, to monitor and to change that network dynamically means that we as consumers are gonna have access to, to more connected devices at lower costs. And, and that just sort of continues that cycle of innovation for a long period of time. And uh, so the foundation of, you know, as we've talked about the building blocks here today, it's right, the public partnership, private partnership of making sure we have access to deploy the, the technology combined with the right amount of spectrum available. And then that just leads to innovation and technology that together sort of sets us on the right foot as, a, as, as the United States to lead the world in, in, in 5G. So uh, Chairman Pai has done a terrific job uh, in the role and, and uh, uh, really thankful for his leadership over the last, uh, over the last few years. I have to say, I may need you to call my mom because she's still skeptical that I actually <laughs> do anything in this job. What do you do all day? It's great to have someone like Jay uh, reaffirm that. But no, seriously, thank you for the support and for the hard work that you and others have done in this sector. It, uh, it's one thing to put the building blocks in place. It's another one to arrange them to deliver value for the consumer. And you've done that in spades uh, here and around the world. So you know, kudos to you for that. Thank you. Well, thank you both so much. Um, Chairman Pai, I do have to say I'm a little disappointed in one thing. I thought maybe Ginger would make an appearance <laughs> today. That's right. Yeah, the kids are, I don't know if you can hear them, they're running her ragged uh, in the next room. So, uh, but she's still tweeting at a lot of bulldogs. So if you want, okay. uh, she'll, she'll make an appearance there shortly, I'm sure. We'll, we'll check that out after we're finished this afternoon. Well, <laughs> thank you both very much. I'm sure our audience today really appreciates hearing from both the government perspective and the private sector perspective and the progress that we've made on broadband and 5G deployment across the country has really, really been tremendous. And we all look forward to a really bright future. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Great. Thanks so much. My Bye -bye. pleasure. Great, so before I turn it over to Jeff for this afternoon's panel, we're fortunate to have a few voices from communities that have benefited from this deployment. They're just going to talk really briefly about their experiences and we have Mayor Dyer from Orlando, Florida first. Hi, I'm Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer. We want to become America's premier future ready city and use technology and connectivity to make people's lives better. And that depends on how effectively 5G can be deployed in our community. So we've modernized our permitting process to expedite 5G deployment. 5G wireless technology is going to be the backbone of America's innovation economy, and we want to be America's premier 5G city. That's great. And then a video from Aquanetta Warren from Fontana, California. Thank you so much. Hello, and welcome to the great city of Fontana. I'm Mayor Aquanetta Warren. I'm so honored to be able to give these comments to a program that we can't wait to see. Here in the city of Fontana, we are committed to doing everything we can to close the digital divide and ensure our community, especially our students, have access to internet. All students should have the ability to learn anytime, any place, and in any virtual setting, regardless of the student's social economic status. That's why I'm ecstatic about this project, whereby Crown Castle and Fontana Unified School District have partnered to provide high-speed internet access to more than 36,000 students at their homes and in their community. This project will create the nation's first citizens broadband radio service, which is private networking dedicated solely to education. Establishing this network is a significant step to providing equitable access and provide students with the opportunity to become leaders in the digital age. Join me with the happiness of how it feels when we can provide access to this new 21st century software, 
engineering, but more important, helping our students be successful. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, now we're gonna turn to our panel. So if the panelists could unmute their videos and screens, uh, just to briefly introduce everybody, we've got Michael Connolly from Crown Castle, uh, Kara Mullaly from Corning Optical Communications, Marie Silla Dixon uh, from T-Mobile and Dave Wright from Comscope. So, you know, today we have this diverse group of panelists uh, all within different parts of the 5G ecosystem. You know, T-Mobile with its unique spectrum holdings, Crown Castle with its range of tower infrastructure and emerging small cell business, uh, Corning whose uh, fiber powers everything from uh, cell sites to last mile and Comscope's innovative solutions for both wired and wireless networks. So this is really a, a cool opportunity to hear from them all just how some seemingly arcane policy is driving this real world innovation. Uh, so I'm going to start off with a pretty broad question that you can kind of use to introduce yourself as well. Um, but the pandemic obviously is the overarching you know, shadow of this discussion and it's driven a lot of Americans indoors, meaning that you know, we're relying on broadband connectivity more than ever. So I'd love it if we could talk a little bit about you know, what does this connectivity mean to consumers and, and how are your organizations uh, benefiting from this 5G fast plan and helping ensure that Americans are able to stay connected while fully realizing the benefits of this connectivity. Uh, so I guess, Michael, if you wanna start us off. Sure, thanks for the introduction. I'm on our corporate strategy team. Uh, you know, if you look at the past year, it's really been a digital transformation on a national scale. You know, not only are we all connected via video conferencing now and using productivity tools to uh, collaborate with our colleagues across the country um, day in, day out basis. When we're not in our offices at home, we're playing IT administrator and teacher's assistant for our kids that, you know, is part of virtual schooling or hybrid schooling. Um, and after work, we're ordering dinner that's delivered you know, from uh, mobile app to our doors. Uh, we're ordering groceries like we never have done before. Uh, we, there's, uh, we order e-commerce e whether it's Amazon or other companies and have all the supplies delivered to our home. Uh, and you know, there's even now an ability to get a consult from your doctor, again, using kind of telehealth. Um, and underpinning all of these great uh, new capabilities really is connectivity. And some of the industry experts say that we've advanced kind of 10 years worth of technology development and adoption into a matter of months. And I think, you know, if you go back to the introduction with Chairman Pai and Jay, it's really, I think, been prescient on, on the part of the FCC in terms of what they've done to make more bandwidth available and to accelerate the adoption of 5G and to uh, streamline the regulations that enable it to get adopted faster. And in addition to the 5G being made available now on the part of the, uh, the wireless operators, I'd just like to take a moment to really talk about how shared infrastructure helps all of the operators uh, deploy that 5G capability more quickly and uh, get it in the hands of consumers. The first is really uh, that there's a, a cost advantage related to shared infrastructure. Uh, instead of one wireless operator bearing 100% of the cost of a particular uh, note. Now you have multiple operators able to kind of share that cost burden. Additionally, there's a time to market advantage. Uh, after that first node has been complete, additional operators can get onto the same node in a much more rapid fashion. And finally, weaving in uh, the, the communities and their concerns, uh, you're able to address kind of some of their aesthetic concerns by having it be kind of in a, in a single location uh, rather than multiple instances uh, down the street. And you have less disruption, you're digging once, if you will. So all of those together, I think are really things that make 5G become more available and, and, and suit kind of what are clear uh, use cases that, that everyone needs uh, in, in the market today. Fantastic. Uh, Kara, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I would say one of the things um, that this pandemic and the drive indoors has really um, done is, and broadband, having access to broadband, whether it be wireless, wireline, um, fiber enabled or copper enabled, is that the abrupt shift to sending everybody to remote locations to work really allowed many people to stay employed and allowed many employers to continue to function at a reasonable rate. Um, so yes, is schooling important? Of course. Is the telehealth important? Of course. But 
being able to have as many folks um, continue the, the day-to-day -day operations and, and have that available, not only from the corporation side, but from the uh, individual personal um, employees' ability to remain connected is critical. And you know, we see from the wireline side, there's been a surge of people getting connected. Uh, we've seen pledges from many different operators, whether they're wireless or wireline, uh, really pledge to keep people connected in an era where many folks are struggling to pay their bills. So I commend the industry in total for kind of doing what's right uh, in the midst of a really challenging time. Great. Marie, do you wanna jump in with T-Mobile's perspective here? Yeah, Jeff, thank you so much. Um, I also uh, just wanna thank, um, you know, Crown Castle for having this event. Um, but I also wanna thank Chairman Pai for his leadership on really being a visionary and really helping to accelerate um, this 5G ecosystem for the US. So. Um, just wanted to uh, give him a shout out and thank him for that. And I think just like uh, Michael and um, Cara said, um, connectivity right now, especially in light of the pandemic, um, I think you, you heard it best um, from Mayor um, Warren um, when she talked about um, the access. Um, and when you think about the digital divide, and how this uh, digital transformation has really put a spotlight on kids. I mean, this is a difference right now between um, a lack of connectivity and children um, falling behind in school. Um, it also means, you know, for folks who are at high risk in health, um, being able to have access to a doctor, um, you know, virtually. It also means the difference between you know, those of us who are fortunate to uh, work at home um, to still have a job um, because we're able uh, to have that connectivity to work um, remotely. Um, so I think right now, you know, we're finding that broadband connectivity is not a nicety. It really is, um, it, 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 is a, uh, it, it is a, it is an essential component of one's everyday life. And because of what it has happened, there really has been a spotlight on um, the uh, inequities in regards um, uh, to access. Um, and so that has come to light. And I can tell you uh, for T-Mobile, uh, we are the second largest uh, wireless carrier for us. Um, it really is our mission as a carrier to make sure that when we are doing our 5G build out, that we are helping to bridge uh, the digital divide. Um, so because of the 5G uh, 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 fast plan, we've been able to build out in areas that are rural and areas that are also underserved. Um, and building out a 5G um, a build out, just this year we have even uh, lit up our mid-band spectrum in over 200 cities and towns. And again, that also includes uh, rural areas. And what that means for consumers is, it means access to new offerings um, that are affordable, access to innovation on our network. Um, that also means, you know, we just did our uh, T-Mobile for Good initiative where we launched our Project 10 Million um, where we are launching, it's a, a $10.7 billion, $10 billion five-year commitment to ensure uh, that school-aged children have connectivity. It's free access, free devices. Um, it also means having access to our T-Mobile Connect plan, which is a low $15 a month plan um, with text and two gigabits of high-speed data. Um, so those really are the benefits um, of that fast track plan, but it's also making sure that, um, you know, folks don't let, get left behind in this 5G world. It's allowing us as carriers uh, to enter these marketplaces uh, to build out that innovation, but also build it out um, in a way where we can expedite um, and really accelerate um, uh, this build out. Great. And Dave, do you want to close this topic off? 
Yeah, happy to. And uh, I want to also just thank um, Crown Castle and R Street for the opportunity to be here. Um, uh, I am the head of spectrum policy at Comscope, so my comments will largely be focused on spectrum. I'll try to be a little bit more well-rounded than that. But just to follow up on a couple of the other comments, you know, Mike was talking about a lot of the ways that American citizens and consumers are making use of uh, connectivity during the pandemic. He was talking about ordering food in the evenings. I was thinking about my young adult children who spend um, lots and lots of time and lots and lots of bandwidth uh, with their online gaming and Twitch. And it's probably not the Atari 2600 that the uh, chairman was talking about anymore. But um, yeah, we're driving a lot of bandwidth that way. And then to uh, Kara's point about um, you know her uh, appreciation uh, for the people who've done a lot to keep, uh, especially the less um, you know socioeconomically privileged people connected during this time. You know, I echo that sentiment, and I really appreciate the Chairman Pai's leadership with the uh, Keep America Keep America Connected program, uh, as well as some of the you know, really emergency actions the Commission took to make Spectrum available. Um, you know, uh, repurposing very quickly some bands uh, and putting those into use. So from a Comscope perspective, you know, how has the commission's, um, you know, actions, leadership, and particularly the 5G fast plan, you know, affected the outcomes we've seen during the response to the pandemic? Um, we, we, like Corning, um, provide a lot of broadband connectivity, fixed broadband connectivity, whether that is fiber to the home or the DOCSIS cable networks. And so, you know, we play a key role there. We also tend to provide the Wi-Fi componentry that's in the actual you know, gateway or set-top box. So we're seeing a lot of the traffic patterns, and we're certainly seeing a lot of increased um, traffic, uh, particularly in the upstream, um, more so than we would normally have seen. And so it's been interesting and I think encouraging to see how the providers have really been able to scale their networks to meet those demands. And I think it speaks to the the resiliency, the robustness, <clears throat> excuse me, of the American infrastructure that we've been able to handle the subsurge in traffic that we've seen. And then switching to the wireless side, as the chairman mentioned, there's really three pillars, two 5G fast, um, you know, spectrum infrastructure policy, and then regulatory modernization. And on the spectrum front, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't agree, you know, more strongly with the other comments that have been made here, I think by Jay, Mike, and, and the chairman himself that, uh, and, and by Marie, that the commission has really done a superlative job making more spectrum available. And you can you know, break that into the mid, uh, excuse me, the low, mid and high bands, or you can talk about it in terms of uh, licensed, unlicensed, or now shared spectrum. And I think that there's general consensus that the mid bands were, were an area where you know, the US was, was maybe not where it needed to be uh, three or four years ago, quite honestly, especially as we talk about uh, 5G leadership um, globally. And we've made up a ton of ground there. So, I mean, when we talk about the, uh, the, the spectrum that's been made available in the mid band, you know, licensed, we've got um, C band, we've got the 2.5, which Marie talked about T-Mobile putting into use. Uh, we have the CBRS um, PAL licenses, and then um, in the unlicensed space, you've got the 1200 megahertz of the uh, six gigahertz band that uh, the commission has already moved on, and they're getting ready to act on the um, 45 megahertz of the total 75 megahertz and 5.9 that would be made available for unlicensed. And then finally with CBRS, which I was great to hear Mayor Warren talking about how Fontana um, is going to use that to help keep students connected there. Um, with that, you've got this really innovative approach, which essentially mixes pseudo licensed and pseudo unlicensed in the same frequency ranges, opens it up to a really wide uh, group of deployers and different use cases. And so, you know, it's great that we have seen this come to market, be commercialized, and we're seeing a lot of successes in the first year of CBRS commercial operation. So, again, I think that you know, hats off to the chairman, to the other commissioners, and to all the hardworking staff there, OET, WTB, and the other bureaus uh, for all of the work they've done to make this possible. Great. Thank you. And, you know, there's a lot of different areas we can jump into, but I want to start with something that Marie was talking about. And, you know, one of the key challenges for the broadband industry and policymakers generally has just been closing this digital divide and, you know, making sure people uh, are connected in traditionally un underserved areas. So the, the first question for, for those who want to touch on this, but 
how do you think policymakers, you know, can help these providers who are working to bring 5G to everyone? How can they help uh, industry bridge the digital divide? You want me to start? <laughs> go, go for it. Um, well, I think um, Jay had said it earlier in his comments, um, looking at, you know, partnerships um, when it comes to working um, with industry. And for us, um, you know, one of the, the main commitments that we had for our merger with the new T-Mobile is a commitment for 5G for all. Um, and that was building it out across the country um, and especially to areas um, that lack connectivity or don't have, you know, more than one um, entry in, in, into the marketplace. And I think you, you can look at it in different areas, but at the state and local level, um, I think it's incumbent on policymakers to work um, with the industry um, in establishing you know, a cooperative relationship that produces win-win results um, for communities and companies. Um, at, also at the state and local level, working with policymakers, encouraging them to adopt and renew or extend wireless infrastructure bills um, we know that there have been different bills that have been passed around the country, but it really does help um, industry, and, and I know it, it, it's helped us really expedite um, the build out. And I think it's so crucial, um, especially on industry, on, on us, to go into these communities and educate policymakers and talk about the real life benefits um, that this is going to have on these communities. Um, I mean, this really is a, a difference between, um, you know, the haves and the have nots and, you know, whether someone gets a job, health care, and now we're seeing how it's impacting um, uh, children who are uh, working, who are doing um, remote learning. I also think at the federal level, um, especially now as, as we go into a new Congress and a new administration, um, that, you know, infrastructure is going to be a, 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 an issue that is going to be coming up and that, you know, I, I encourage, you know, for the new Congress or the new administration uh, to really put this on their radar, uh, to make wireless a part of this discussion, because we do know for a lot of people, according, you know, to the Pew report, um, that they rely on wireless as their primary mode of broadband access. Um, not everyone is at the same residents. A lot of people um, who are in unserved communities tend to um, move uh, uh, different uh, to different residences and places to live. Um, so I really encourage um, that this new Congress administration look and find ways where it's feasible to codifying some of the safeguards um, that the FCC has created um, for broadband deployment and to do it in a, a bipartisan way and also in a technology neutral way. Great. Does anyone else want to touch on this digital divide question? Well, I, I just uh, weave together two things. One is the video you saw from uh, Mayor Warren, as well as comments made by Dave uh, related to CBRS. And, you know, this network that we're standing up with the Fontana Unified School District, you know, wouldn't it be possible if there weren't uh, the ability to have shared spectrum that allow us to very rapidly deploy essentially a, a private secure network specifically for addressing the underserved, under, under bandwidth populations in that area. And you know, the, the ability to do that and, and recognize that there's a deficiency that uh, is essential in order to uh, keep uh, you know, students on, on par uh, to uh, advance uh, digital education on a long-term basis is really, again, I think evidence of the foresight that this commission had and, uh, and unleashed innovation in ways that really have long-term lasting benefits on the student populations. And I would just say, um, you know, Marie's comment about making sure people understand the benefits. A lot of times constituents lean on policymakers um, because they're hearing, you know, the disruption their neighborhood's gonna feel or, you know, are the, are the waves gonna, you know, give me cancer and all, the, all these very scary things that aren't true. And so presenting information um, on the benefits, understanding 
and being very transparent about, yes, that there are going to be, you know, new lamp fixtures or new things on um, sides of buildings or your street might get torn up for, for some amount of time. There is, there is, you know, a pot of gold at the end of this rainbow, right? Uh, and so you just need to, to balance the um, information sharing with the constituents and with these communities that this deployment is going into so that they become advocates of it as well and, and not impediments because um, that noise that you can sometimes hear can really stall um, not only policy, but, but also implementation if, um, if there ends up being disputes in, in some cases with municipalities or, or even just with neighborhoods in particular. And Jeff, I was just going to say, I think that, you know, one, one thing that's clear from the pandemic and from the things that we've discussed here, you know, Marie was talking about how there are many people who are really, you know, mobile only in terms of their connectivity. Um, and then uh, Mike was talking again about the example from Fontana with CBRS, uh, you know, helping out with the connectivity for the students there. So you've got license, you've got shared. And then um, on the unlicensed piece, kind of bringing that in, yeah, I think everybody's aware that we're incredibly reliant on Wi-Fi uh, and the unlicensed bands for sort of that last, um, not last mile, but you know, last couple of feet delivery, right? From the, the access point or router in your, uh, in your home to your phone or your uh, laptop while you're in the home. Um, I like to throw out an example of, you know, one of the solutions that we've been um, kind of working closely with a lot of school districts on deploying, which is, uh, equipping school buses, because many of the districts where they're doing remote learning now, they don't really need the buses to take the kids to the school. So what they've done is they've outfitted a number of the buses with Wi-Fi access points, typically ones with a little bit more increased range, directional antennas, these sorts of things. And they'll take those out to an area of the community and, um, and use that to provide Wi-Fi access to, to students who otherwise wouldn't have connectivity to get their assignments done, do their research, submit, um, submit schoolwork, et cetera. And, um, and that's well and good, but you know, there's not a lot of fiber that runs to every place you might want to park a school bus. So the way that we get the, uh, the backhaul from the school buses is almost uh, always using a, a cellular air link, whether it's um, you know, typically LTE today, hopefully 5G in the future. So we've got some access points that have this uh, cellular backhaul capability. And that's a great example of how licensed and unlicensed spectrum are working together, both playing to their strengths to meet a really critical need right now. So again, I think it just underscores the need for a comprehensive spectrum policy. Yeah, that's, like, that's very true. Um, I'm gonna try to focus us in a little bit now on the infrastructure side of things. I know we've touched on it in a couple different areas, but you know, the FCC over the last few years has really sped up federal review uh, of, of you know, these infrastructure deployments. They've uh, reviewed some of the local processes for small cell deployments. And you know, they've modernized a lot of the pole uh, attachment regulations. You know, all of these are very technical pieces to this kind of 5G deployment puzzle, but I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about what these reforms um, are actually doing in terms of affecting deployment and, you know, what does this mean for consumers? And uh, anyone who wants to take this can go ahead and, and take the lead here. I'll jump in with a couple points. Uh, the first really is if, if you go back in time, towers were built for a single tenant. So the first thing that you would observe is that uh, for example, the tower site expansion order is something that, that gives a lot more flexibility to tower companies to support mobile network operators and to have a streamlined process in order to, you know, to, to expand the equipment that's there on, on the site. And, and that's really important because you know, as we add more radios, as we add more uh, mobile operators on a single site, you need that flexibility. But more importantly, I, I think is really the regulatory certainty and the predictability uh, that these orders have really afforded us. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard to do better than you know, the examples that Jay cited earlier, but you know, when you're deploying uh, new 5G small cells, for example, and you need to lay fiber and you need to know kind of uh, what the rules of the road are and, and to have a streamlined process and a collaborative process where you can do that uh, and, and have you know, a, a really kind of well-defined schedule and uh, not have the cost overruns. And, and it ultimately facilitates a much faster time to market. And that benefits not just the wireless operators, but ultimately uh, the consumers themselves. Uh, there's a couple other things I just highlight uh, also uh, as a result of this network resiliency. 
Increasingly, we're seeing that wireless operators may need to have backup uh, at the tower, and that's not something that was, again, originally planned for uh, in terms of the, the, the compound itself. Uh, and, and then uh, finally, just land use policy. This, is, this makes sense to, to use land in, in a more efficient fashion rather than having to, to create a redundant infrastructure, you know, one, uh, one block over uh, or, or the like. So again, I just saw you know, greater transparency, greater collaboration really helps to, to foster more rapid uh, deployment of, of 5G. And I'm just gonna, um, I agree just 100% with what Michael just said. For us, I mean, we're deploying, we're upgrading and lighting up um, small cells, microcells. Um, I mean, our numbers are, I think, seven to 800 a week. I mean, so this has really helped us to expedite um, our, our, our 5G build out and really um, it's enabled us to take the spectrum that we have um, and that we um, were able to obtain with the new company um, with the 2.5 and making sure that we light it up and we're using it quickly. And that in turn is, um, you know, again, we're going back, we're lighting up in, in parts of the country, um, again, that were either underserved or rural areas where they didn't have that connectivity. Um, so the impact, there is a clear impact that this has on consumers, um, but it really has um, provided, I think, the industry and us with clarity, predictability, as Michael said, um, so that we um, it can build out, um, you know, the various markets. Yeah, 100% agree. I think that the, the two things allowing for some certainty with which, you know, when the shot clock is up and, you know, they get the green light to go and some guardrails on the cost just allow people and operators to plan that much more effectively uh, and efficiently and then have more money because they're not experiencing cost overruns and delays uh, to do more with the money they do have. And so that's going to you know, pay dividends to the consumers long term. Yeah, I was just gonna. I was just gonna bring it back to something I believe the chairman mentioned uh, in his uh, comments, which is you know, to meet some of the performance targets of five G, both on the latency and the area capacity realms. You know, we're gonna need very dense deployments of these uh, of these radios, right? Small cells, picos, and macros. And um, so I think all of the you know the different programs that the other panelists have been talking about here are gonna help get to that dense deployment that we're going to need. Um, but that's really in the outdoor realm, right? So the other aspect of it is, you know, general rule of thumb is about 80% of, um, you know, mobile data usage occurs indoors. So I also appreciate the commission's leadership on, again, things like CBS, things like unlicensed spectrum, which tend to be utilized, you know, more heavily in building um, and can be deployed really by, you know, a, a very broad group of, of players. And, you know, that will help spread out the, uh, you know, the CapEx that's going to be needed to, to build those dense networks. So that's just another point I would make. Yeah, there's a lot of really important points to be made on the infrastructure, but just in the sake of time, I'm going to move us on to the issue of spectrum, try to focus a little bit more um, on some of the licensed spectrum that we've been seeing made available from the FCC. Uh, in particular, over the last few years, as, as we've talked about so far, is that the major focus, at least at the commission, has been trying to make more of that mid-band spectrum available. And I'm curious, Dave, if you want to start us off here, you know, what, what does this influx of mid-band spectrum actually mean uh, for the next several years of, of wireless deployments, and what can consumers expect? Sure. Well, mid-band really is, is, you know, a lot of people use the phrase Goldilocks. I guess let's glom onto that and say, you know, it provides a great mix of both coverage. Um, so you get, can, with, you know, with MIMO antennas, you can get a, a decent range at reasonable power levels, um, you know, which would be more like what Marie would be uh, deploying with Timo. Um, you know, but you can also do a lot of capacity because you tend to get, you know, a channel bandwidth in the, you know, uh, well, in a license realm, they're looking at 80 to 100 megahertz wide channels per operator. In the unlicensed realm, we're looking at, you know, making up to 160 and even potentially 320 megahertz wide channels available for things like Wi-Fi and the uh, NR unlicensed NRU that the chairman referred to earlier. So it's a, it's, it's a great, you know, th these were bands that, you know, uh, 10, 15 years ago were viewed as, as sort of technically hard to work with um, because of just the state of the art in RF propagation and antenna technology. 
Um, and today they're perfect. So it's kind of encouraging that, you know, we're, we're able to make use of higher frequencies uh, as time goes along. But um, yeah, the as I sort of alluded to before, we were, we were a little bit behind the curve um, in terms of mid-band as a country, you know, call it four or five years ago. Um, and you've heard about a lot of the 5G deployments going on in Asia and in Europe in the you know, 3.4 to 3.8 gigahertz range in particular. Um, and so the fact that we now have, you know, 280 megahertz of prime uh, you know, mid-band spectrum that'll be licensed in less than a month, actually, now December 8th is when the auction is going to start for C-band. And that'll give, you know, a, I'm, I'm assuming we're going to end up with three licensees, you know, with blocks of 180 megahertz. Uh, that's revolutionary. That's transformative in terms of the kinds of things that you can do as a mobile operator with that amount of spectrum in the uh, in the CBRS band, we've given 150 megahertz of spectrum to you know essentially all comers. Um, you can participate at the uh, at the PAL tier, which is the pseudo license tier. We've already had an auction of those licenses. The auction was extremely successful, raised a lot more money than people thought it would. But probably more importantly, there were 227 different entities which secured licenses everybody from the mobile operators to the cable operators, to energy utility companies, to uh, smaller WISPs, uh, to real estate investment trusts um, in Arlington, Virginia. So it really kind of proved out just again, the flexibility um, and the adaptability of CBS for different use cases, both public and private. Um, and then I've talked about unlicensed. So, you know, the fact that we're getting, you know, the 1200 megahertz in the six gigahertz band um, and then also closing that that gap uh, at the top of the five gigahertz band with 5.9 proceeding. You know, these are all the kinds of initiatives in my mind that are going to fuel the U.S. wireless market for the next 10 years. Um, so, you know, and, and now we have to start thinking about what we're going to do in 10 years because uh, it takes a while. And just to add to, to Dave's points there, and it's hard to top it, but uh, on the exclusively licensed spectrum, one of the great things about this, whether we're talking about the 2.5 gigahertz or the CBRS or the C-band uh, or, or the, the DOD um, spectrum is that it's unused. And so you've got an ability to immediately load that up and, and to recognize that, that you can realize the speeds uh, of, of 5G, uh, truly re realize that because you're not sharing that with 4G spectrum, uh, 4, 4G uh, radios as well. Uh, the, the other thought too on CBRS is when you looked at some of the PAL auction winners, you know, they were oil and gas, it was energy, it was uh, IoT solutions for logistics. These are, because of the fact that that was at a county level, you were, they were able to micro target the uh, PALs that they needed for the use cases that they wanted to serve. So you had a lot of new entrants with very specific uh, use cases in addition to the, the GAA spectrum that we talked about earlier that, that allows anyone to use it. Uh, the final thought I'll, I'll share on CBRS is really, it's also a shared radio story as well, not a shared spectrum, because you know, it, it's, a pos it's possible now to use it, for example, as an alternative to a DAS system for indoor coverage and to light up all carriers on a common shared radio. And, in, and one of the great things about that in turn is you know, historically DAS systems were kind of uh, network operator specific, expensive, and therefore relegated really to the biggest arenas, the biggest uh, stadiums. Now you have the ability to, to bring the, the coverage down and therefore cover more places that are perhaps smaller venues, smaller concert halls, college campuses and the like uh, with again, uh, a solution that is more secure, uh, has less interference and is, is more scalable than say uh, Wi-Fi itself. Well, we're running really low on time, but just to bring Marie into this real quick, uh, you know, I've, I've heard a lot about T-Mobile's, you know, layer cake strategy and let's take advantage of the best uh, spectrum for different uses. Can you talk a little bit about how you're integrating low band, mid band and high band all into, you know, one service? Yeah, so we actually do have a layer cake. <laughs> um, this was actually something that our uh, CTO, our chief technology officer, Neville Ray, um, really was, you know, a pioneer when it came to looking at a multi-band approach when it came to our, our 5G build out. And for us, I mean, mid-band, very, very important. I mean, it's one of the reasons why we, we had our merger with Sprint 
and we've been able to light up that 2.5. Um, but we also realize that in order to do this build out, you need uh, the foundation, um, which is the low band spectrum. So we had the, the 600. Um, and so that has great coverage where it's far and wide. It's helping us uh, do that 5G build out out in more of the rural areas. But so that's the foundation. And then when you put mid band over that, um, it's broad, it's super fast. Again, Michael said it's the Goldilocks of spectrum and that together it does amazing things in terms of speed and the way that it can travel. And then if you put at the top layer um, for really, really super fast speeds, and this is what's also helping us with our in-home broadband play, that's you know the high band um, where it, it's great and, and more denser um, inside uh, denser uh, populated areas and inside. And so that um, is the, the layer cake approach. Um, and I think for us, again, you know, we were thinking about this approach all along in terms of uh, and strategy, in terms of our build out. And that has really helped us in terms of, you know, our speeds. And now our speeds are like, you know, 100 megabytes per second or you know, just really crazy, crazy speed. And it's also by taking this approach and being creative, it's also allowed us um, to go to places where it most likely would have been, you know, difficult um, to do the build out. Great, and with the last minute or so, Kara, I wanna bring you in real quick before we, we close this out. Um, you know, are we, we've talked a lot about spectrum and some of the infrastructure policy we're not just only going to be talking about spectrum, right? There's going to be a lot more involved fiber. You know, what is the future of fiber and how does that affect, you know, 5G? Yeah, absolutely. I would say um, fiber is foundational to all communication technologies, whether it's, you know, pure wireline fiber to the uh, end user or fiber to a macro tower, uh, all the way up the tower to the radio head, now to small cells. Uh, in building, we're even seeing fiber go horizontally to, to desks, right? Not just stopping at the at the riser. And so fiber is foundational to, to all of these initiatives. Um, depending on the operator, depending on the density, the type of uh, cells they're putting in in the wireless space in particular, you know, the volume of fiber will vary, uh, whether they're doing dedicated send receive on different strands of glass, whether they're implementing wave division multiplexing to, to get more paths of light on a single strand of glass. Uh, either way, there's gonna be an awful lot of glass. Yeah. And so um, we're super excited about supporting the initiative. Very thankful to have uh, had a place here on the panel today because uh, 5G is gonna be awesome uh, when it hits in full. And I think even just some of the statistics of where we were last year versus where we were um, closing out October, um, it's like that hockey stick, right? It's it's going to keep going up. And so we're here for it. Great. I think we are now out of time. So I'm going to turn it back over to Stacy. Great. Thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate your time, the thoughtful questions. And of course, thank you so much for our panelists, Kara and Marie and Dave and Mike. This was a fantastic discussion. And I, I can foresee a future discussion where we're talking about building on the accomplishments that we discussed today. I also want to give a special thanks to Chairman Pai for making the time to join us and for R Street for co-hosting the event. And at the risk of making this sound like the Academy Awards, I also want to thank Evan from Chairman Pai's office for suggesting this event. He provided the ideas and brought this together and the secret behind the scenes, the fabulous Glen Echo Group for organizing all of this, um, pulling it together. It's just been a, a real, uh, promising opportunity to learn and to share with each other. So I just want you all to know that the video will be available to all attendees uh, in the future. And I think that will be provided either by R Street or the Glen Echo Group. So thank you all uh, for participating and attending today. We could talk for a long time, but I think many of us now need to go attend the FCBA virtual auction this year. So plug in for your participation in that event next. Thank you. Thank you.